Okay, so this is, um, I don't know why it says chapter three. It should be chapter four. I think, I just noticed that. Four collective geons. I think the notes are bad. They're probably missing one chapter. So anyway, I will fix that later, but it's, um, it's chapter four. So anyway, moving on. So this is about collective geons. Last week we saw individual geons, which means that you're only plotting like one scatter plot, right? Like you're not combining it with anything else, like let's say a scatter plot and lines. So that's exactly what we're gonna go through this here. So we're gonna understand the difference between the two when you have just one individual geon versus when you have several geoms, so lines and plot and uh, dots or box plots and lines, etc. And then the key thing here is to understand the aesthetics and part of the aesthetics when you have one and many geoms, so just a single individual geom, or when you have aesthetics, different aesthetics for different geoms, and the group the group um, arguments. So I think those are the main topics here. So like we like we saw last week with with Colin, an individual geom draws a distinct graphical object for each observation. So that means that if we have points, each row or each individual, each observation that we have, it's going to be assigned an individual geom, which could be points or lines or a box plot. Well, not a box plot because, well, I guess a box plot too, but it's that includes summary. Um, but a collective geom, what it's going to do is going to display multiple observations with one geometric object. And this is when we start seeing, for example, sum or when we do a summary of a series of points. So then we don't have one observation per point, let's say. So we have the mean of something. So for example, a result of statistical summaries. So individual sum uh, numbers versus the sum of the numbers. So this sum is going to convert a series of values, individual values, to a single number, which is going to be, for example, the mean, the median, the standard deviation, something like that. For example, uh, if we look at home prices under individual geoms, each home price is going to have a point on a plot table, but under collective geoms, we're going to see a median. So like, for example, um, all of those numbers is going to be collected into one value, which is in this case, the median. So we have to understand how to display that in ggplot. So let's work with this data set that it's part of the um, L LMEE package, if I'm not mistaken. This data set is called Oxvoice. And what it's showing is for each one of the subjects identified, you can see here in the glimpse, identified by a number. So subject one corresponds to the same subject, right? And each row is showing me the value assigned for that specific moment where they measured subject one and they collected the age, the height, and the occasion when that was taken, right? So here we can see for subject one, he was, um, information from that subject was gathered on nine occasions and so on with the following subjects. Oh, hi, Ashley. So the measurement that they took from each one of the subjects are gonna be age and height. So if the goal is to separate data into groups that you don't care about individual subjects, so you don't care if subject one, subject two, you really don't care about um, individual measurements, I should say, not individual subjects. You don't care about individual measurements and you sort of wanna con um, congregate by each one of those subjects, meaning that's the group, right? Like each one of the subjects, this, all of these measurements become a group for that subject. So then is when we add this group argument to the aesthetic. So if you're trying to figure out which variable to use as the grouping variable, one advice that the book gives is that I have multiple observations for each, in this case, subject. 
in this case, it's a slow, it's a longitudinal study, so that's going to be super easy to identify, right? But I want to plot one line over time for each subject. If we if we had penguins, for example, and we wanted to do the same thing with the penguin with the Palmer penguin data set, we could say that I have multiple observations for each species, for example, right? So we have for for each one of the Palmer penguin species, we have a series of measurements that we took. So this is how you can identify what is your group. Whatever you put in that line, that becomes your group. So in the case of the Ox Voice data set, what we want to do is plot a line over time for each one of the subjects, which that's the one that becomes the uh, grouping variable for the aesthetics. So let's see one example for this. So if we have our ggplot, you're, we're using this Ox Voice data, and we are putting the aesthetics um, in that ggplot first layer. We're identifying what's going to be our x, which is going to be h, our y is going to be height, and then we're saying that we want to group our variables by subject. We then go and visualize points, and then we want lines. So the points and the line are going to be um, following the same grouping variable. All of the aesthetics that we have here set in the ggplot, those are going to trickle down to the points and the lines because it's inside that ggplot. If we were to put the aesthetics inside the geom point, then those would be assigned just for that geom point or just for that geom line. But because we have it in the ggplot, this is going to go to all the geoms that we have here. So that this is how the data looks like. If we didn't have the group, then the lines wouldn't be connected. So we have here for our, let's say that this is our first subject. These are all the values that correspond to that first subject. So that's going to be the age and height. Um, so this was the height assigned or that this subject recorded for when they have this age. This is the height that it had for the following age and blah, 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 blah. So each line is going to be a subject. It's going to correspond to each individual subject. You really don't care which subject, like which line corresponds to each subject. So you don't have a legend. If you wanted to add a legend, we're going to see exactly how that would look like later on. But here, you don't care about that. You don't care about which line corresponds to each individual um, subject, each individual patient. So you just want to see how they stack together. When you're misidentifying your group in variable, what you're going to get is this sawtooth appearance in your data. So then this is telling you there's something wrong, you either have to group your data or whatever it is that you put in your group variable is wrong. So every time you get these weird lines, one quick thing to do is go and think about what group you can use here, what variable you can use as a, as a group. So then Let's take a look at multiple geoms and these multiple aesthetics, right? Like these aesthetics that I was telling you about can go either for every one of your geoms or they can be assigned to different uh, geoms. Let's add a collective geom, which is a trend line for all boys together. So if we go to our Ox Boys data again and we say that the aesthetics that are going to go Across all of our geoms are going to be the X and the Y, which are H and height. But now what I'm saying is that for the geom line, which is the first layer that's going to be created here, so that's like the first layer that's going to show up, I am going to say that just for that geom, I want the grouping variable to be subject. Then on top of that geom line, I'm going to put points because these are layers that are going to be stuck together. On top of that, I want points. I don't have a grouping variable there. And then I'm going to do a geom smooth. I also don't have a, a grouping variable here. And these are the arguments for that geom smooth, which is essentially just showing a, 
uh, linear model showing the association between H and height. So this is exactly how that graph looks like. So if you see here, the only thing that's grouped is going to be the lines. I'm also showing points, which they're just identifying each one of the occasions where each subject was measured. But because the GM smooth doesn't have a grouping variable, what this is showing is just the trend over all my values. If I would have put here group in the GM smooth or in the ggplot, then I would have a linear model for each one of my subjects. But oftentimes that's not what I want, right? Like I want just one linear model for all of my data sets. But for whatever reason, I, you know, if I use block designs or something, I want to see the grouping variable. So the other thing is that we can assign different aesthetics to different geoms. And we can also assign color fields alphas outside of the aesthetic. So that, how does that look like? So again, we go to the Oxvoice um, data set, and we're going to say that we want occasion to be our x variable, and height is going to be our y variable. Then I want a geom box plot. So I want a box plot to look at the relationship between these two variables. And on top of that, I'm going to put lines. But those lines are going to be grouped by subject. So whatever I put inside the aesthetics, that's going to control or that's going to call or use a variable from my data set. Then if I put color, for example, outside of the aesthetics, that is going to accept one value or many values. It depends on if you have different groups, etc. But that color is going to be, in this case, the color that is going to be across all of your lines. It's the same color. And then the alpha, which controls the transparency. So this is what the variable looks like. The box plot is not grouped. So the box plot is, um, it's just showing for each occasion, what are all the values that are for that height? And then the lines are the ones that are uh, grouped by subject. So that's why you see them like that. If I were to put color inside the aesthetics, then I would have assigned a value, uh, not a value, a variable like subject, for example, and then each line would have looked different for each subject. So that's the difference when we put the color outside of the aesthetics versus when we put it inside. And we're going to see an example of that. So I'm going to skip these exercises because they're very, they're very simple and easy to understand. But let's look at that matching aesthetics to graphic objects. So what happens when different aesthetics are mapped to a single geometric element? So for example, here, we were talking about um, using, so we're moving, I should have put the other example here when we when you put color inside the aesthetics, but I didn't put it here. I think I put it later on. So we're moving to a different topic right now, which is, so sorry about that, but the book is, like I said, a little confusing. So now we're moving to another topic. The topic now is when we have discrete and continuous variables that you are using in the aesthetics. So how does that going to look like? So for example, here, the question that the book was talking about is what happens when different aesthetics are mapped to a single geometric element, or when you have um, each one of your geoms with a different aesthetic, right? So the lines and paths operate on a first value principle. Each segment is going to be defined by two observations, and then ggplot is going to apply the aesthetic value, for example, the color, associated with the first observation when drawing the segment. So it's like that first one, and then it's going to move to the, to the next one. So let's see an example of that. If we create this bogus, not bogus, this um, fictitious data frame with just x123 and y123, and we assign a different color to each one of our uh, x, y values, x and y values. So then what we do is we put that into a ggplot, but we say that inside the aesthetics, we're going to assign for color, we're going to say each one of those values that I have for color, 
I want it to have a different color, a different value. So that's why when the when color, feel, or um, shape, when those are inside the aesthetics, you can use one of the value, one of the variables that you have in your data frame. When they are outside, then you can assign the color, the exact color that you want or the exact shape that you want, if it's a triangle or whatever. So then here, um, the only reason why they put factor here is so that it's it's not seen as a so that it's seen as a that it has an order that it's one, three, and five. That's the only reason why they put factor here, which you could have also done in the data frame, modified it as a mutate with a with a factor there. So then what you do is if we do want to see a linear um, a line going through our points or x and y values. And we're going to say that all of them are correspond to one group. So they are all part of the same thing. So group them like that. That, that line is going to have to go through all of those points. If not, then each individual one is, would have had a, a line. So that's why they are grouping it like that. We're controlling outside of this. The line width, we give it a value, which is going to be 2 in this case. The higher you go, the thicker the line is going to look like. And then we also want points for each one of our x, y values. And the size that we want is going to be, again, outside of the aesthetics. So all of the points are going to have the same size, and it's going to be, in this case, 5. If we would have put the size inside the aesthetics, we would have had for example, for color, each color would have had a different point size because we're calling a variable. So then this is what the what the graph looks like. Obviously, this has you know no context. This is just a series a series of points. And each one of the so this is what this paragraph was talking about that the first value is going to be assigned that first color that you have. And then, so that's going to be the point. Uh, that's going to be the um, the point and the line because both of them are under color, right? Like color is controlling all of them. So we're going to have this one for the first uh, value, green, which is the second color for the sec second um, value, and then the third value is going to be the point and then the corresponding line, which we don't have another line anymore, right? So that's that's where the third color is going to go. Then if we have, for example, instead of having a discrete variable, which in this case, this is what we did with the factor, right? We made color a discrete variable. If we have it as a continuous variable, what's going to happen is we're going to have a gradient of color here. So it's going to go from lighter to, from lighter, sorry, from darker to lighter, I suppose. And this is because those numbers are identified. If we do a glimpse here, I'm pretty sure that those numbers are a number. So then ggplot identifies them as a continuous number. And again, the rest stays the same. So that's the difference. I think we all have done graphs here, so we all know about this, right? If you want to have However, this obviously follows the same line, the same rules here as in the first um, value is going to have the darker color, and then the second value is going to have the lighter color. If you want a true gradient, then so that if you see here, this line looks more of a gradient than this one that goes like a like this is just all of this is the same color. And then all of that is the same second color, and it goes like that. If you want a gradient that goes from darker to lighter, and then this line is also looking like a gradient, then for that, we have to do an interpolation first. So we have the grid, and then we're going to, uh, and then obviously here we have the difference between the other one and this one is that we have now a sequence of values um, for each for the minimum value that we had here, which was one, and the maximum, which is three. Now we're creating a sequence of values with a length of 50. So we have one, 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, blah, 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 right? Like from one to three, 50 different values. 
So that's a continuous, um, a continuous variable. And then we're gonna interpolate that in our data frame. So we have that all of the sequence of X values, and then we're going to assign Y uh, values that are corresponding to that X grid too, so that we can have this perfect line, um, 45 degree angle line. And then we're gonna assign also a color, but in this gradient too. So we're going to assign um, continuous variable for X, Y is also continuous and the color is also continuous. So when we do that interpolation, so this is what the new um, data frame look uh, is called, and then that's the one that we're gonna use. So all of our variables here are going to be continuous. So that's why this is look. This looks like this. So if you have a discrete variable and you want it to look like this, you're you're set. But if you want that discrete variable to look like a gradient, then you have to do something like this. You have to that, do that interpolation. All right, that was a big thing just to say, if you have a continuous variable, put them in here, and then your graph is gonna have a gradient in your color palette, right? Because you already have a continuous one. Okay. Uh, so when we're using field, that was with color. When we're using field, field is gonna be for bars, for box plots, for anything that is gonna, polygons, for example, anything that has to be filled. Color is for points and lines, if I'm not mistaken. So then in this case, if we're gonna do a geom bar, what we have here are bars that need to be filled with color. So that's why we use that, um, that uh, argument. And then here, what we say is the geom bar, this is going to count for us, so we don't have to assign it a Y variable. So we are working here with MPG, which is the car um, data frame. So then what this is gonna do, geom bar is going to count for each one of our classes, how many times that was repeated. So that's what geom bar does as opposed to geom call. With geom call, we have to assign it a Y variable, but here we don't, it's gonna count for us. And then inside the aesthetics, again, we're going to give it a variable for the field. So we want it to be, um, I don't remember what the, this DRV variable was, but this is a categorical or a discrete variable. And then this is what it's gonna look like for each one of my classes of car, then it's gonna be divided by, the, by these sections, right, by this and it's shown in the color. If we have a continuous variable in the field, like for example, um, I think this is horsepower, I don't remember. Um, but the, the way that that looks like, it's gonna be like this. If our continuous variable is gonna be again, it's gonna follow like a gradient. But here it doesn't re really make a lot of sense because it's counting how many observations we have for each one of these values, but then, this is not necessarily what you want. How do you interpret that? Because it's a count variable, right? So these graphs are really horrendous for showing this. And I I should have used Palmer penguins, but honestly, I didn't have much time, I'm sorry. Um, and that's it, you guys. That's, that's all the book goes through. The examples or the exercises are super, super simple. But I think that here, what they were trying to show is just one, to use the grouping variable, and the difference of having the fill and color inside the aesthetics, outside the aesthetics, and what happens when you put it inside ggplot or inside the gym. I think those were the ideas here, but yeah, again, it was a little, I don't know if you guys have any any comments, anything that you wanna say? So, yeah, Kaya? Yeah, so, or Colin, yeah? Oh, sorry, Kaya, you had your hand up. No, that's okay. Feel free to go first. Yeah, so let's, I just kind of want to go back to the discrete versus continuous variables. So like the last example, just so that I understand, I think this goes back to like the, the line that we were talking. So the last example, the one that's not the greatest, 
that uses like the fill with a continuous variable. So this That's isn't, what, yeah. a, mm -hmm. this isn't a tr just, I mean, obviously I wouldn't use this plot, but like, just so I understand how ggplot2 works, this isn't a true gradient. Like this is not a true gradient. This is, it's plotting each value as if it was like a discrete, if I would, or it's just actually plotting the actual values itself for the actual color of highway mileage. Is that the way I'm understanding that? So I think what this is doing is, okay, let me go to R and let's go to that one. You guys can see my, my R studio here? Yep. Yeah, we can. Okay. So if we do this one, if we run it, okay. Yeah, this looks horrendous. I don't even know why they are doing this. Um, so the warning that you get, and I don't have that warning. Oh yeah, I have that warning here. So the warning says that the following aesthetics were dropped during statistical transformation, which is the fill. This can happen when ggplot fails to infer the correct grouping structure in the data. So there is no grouping here. So I think that what ggplot is trying to do is for each one of the hwy, let's do that here. Um, no. Bullshit. I. Oh my goodness, my keyboard is really awful. I'm so sorry, you guys. My keyboard has decided to not work well. And I've been having some issues with that. Okay, there we go. I didn't want to go there. Here. Oh. Okay, one, two, three. Boom. Okay. And then. R of there. Yeah. One, two, three. I'm so sorry, but my keyboard is not working. Okay, so if we do um MPG. So let's see this. So this HWI, I don't remember what that variable was. So let's do HWI here. I think, I think it's, it's highway mileage. MPG. Yeah, yeah highway valid mileage. Yeah. MPG, not high. M, M, B, G. Okay. So I think it's, yeah, highway miles per gallon. Okay. So you're going to have here an integer. So what I think this thing is doing is putting, so let's say, for example, for when you have these two seater, let's see if I can do this here. U, M, B, G. Um, so when this two-seater, it's going to have values of, so you're, it's going to count, right? So it's going to say how many times you have that two-seater. So you have that one, two, three, four, five. So that's why you have that line or that bar going all the way up to five. So that, that way mm -hmm. we're good. But now what it has to do is have to assign for highway, for highway, for uh, for mileage, so it's gonna say so it's gonna be twenty six. You're gonna have twenty three. You're gonna have twenty five, twenty four, and those are gonna be your values. So for each one of those colors, it's assigning. I think I think this is what it's doing. For each one of those values, it's assigning a different sort of color. So it's gonna be there is like a light color gradient here but it's obviously not very obvious so for example in this one i think it's more easy to see in compact because for compact when you have the lowest value for compact is probably i don't know maybe probably 25 or 24 mm -hmm. so then or maybe that's the light though no, if it's lightest it's gonna be the 40. So you're going to have some 40s here, mm -hmm. but very, very few. So compact, it has like 144 here. And I think that's it. So because it only has 144, that's that line that you see here, just one. And then let's say that your next, you have 
I don't know, five, uh, 23. So then it goes from, from one here to six with the second value. Does that make sense? So it's stacking them up like that. It, it has to assign a color for each one of these values. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. That, that makes sense. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of so creating, it's, it's kind of treating it like a discrete variable, but it's creating yeah. a discrete variable based on how many it counts, like the statistical summary it's doing. So, okay. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, so it's a very bad way of doing a graph. So I wish they would have shown an example where that makes sense. So essentially, I think that the, the thing here is if you have a continuous variable, then the gradient is going to show exactly that gradient, right? If you have a discrete variable, then it's going to, oh, it, it, I don't have it here. Um, it's this one. If you have a discrete variable, then yeah, you're going to have this. Kaya, you wanted to say something? Um, <clears throat> yeah, my comment was a little bit different, like off this topic, but um, I guess I also found this chapter a little bit confusing, but I think that the framing at the beginning about collective geomes um, was like, I almost wish they had introduced it, the distinction between individual and collective earlier. Like I know the last chapter was about individual geomes, but when I read that, I, I don't think I quite realized like what an individual geome was in contrast to a collective geome. Um, and in particular, the thing I wanted to point out for everybody, because it took me a while to get my head around this, was um, that the bar graph that they showed in the, the previous chapter was technically an individual geome because they used stat equals identity. So you end up with one shape per row of the data frame because that's the distinction, right? Is it one is it one thing per row or is it a collective, you know, summary um, object? And so if you had made a bar graph with stat not equal to identity, now that's a collective geom because now it's one bar that's summarizing the number of observations instead of the identity. And I think that. Like if I had written the chapter, I think I might have done that differently. I think I would have not introduced the bar graph in the previous chapter. I would have introduced it in this one and said, like, by the way, if you make it this way with the data set where you're using stat equals identity, then this is actually an individual geome, not a collective instead of the other way around. Because it took me, I, I was reading the beginning of this chapter and I was like, wait, but what about bar graphs? Like, didn't we just learn about bar graphs and those were somehow individual? So yeah, anyway, just wanted to point that out. Yeah, so Colin, do you have something? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that because I go back to some of the previous examples that I was using, using MPG, because if you actually look at the structure of the MPG data, you're not technically, so like if you do like a scatter plot of the MPG data, it's not correct because it's, or at least my understanding is not correct because it's creating a summary based on that. So if you did like using MPG and you did like, displacement, which is engine size by highway mileage, it's actually creating a collective geome off of some type of summary because you have your observations are based on manufacturer model, uh, year of the car and so on and so forth. And so if you create that, it's actually creating a collective geome, at least in my understanding is creating oh, a collective interesting. geome. Oh, interesting. You're saying because yeah. the data is in long format, so there's more than one it's well, in long format with additional huh. like repeated values of like yeah, a different manufacturer, different model. And so I'm like sitting there, I'm just like, wait a minute, that that's not well, a correct scatter plot. <laughs> no, no. I think, I mean, I think you're right that it wouldn't be a correct scatter plot, but I think it would still be an individual geom because what it would do then is it would plot multiple points per, like it would, you'd have repeated points plotted on top of each other. So it'd still be operating as an individual geom, but then you'd be getting not the result that you want unless you like select the, the columns and run distinct on them or something before making the plot. Yes. And then I think also too, on top of that, I think that's where the discussion of interaction, there's like a function. If you're using a group aesthetic, there's like interaction or something. I can't remember. Yeah. Interaction yes. is like a function called interaction that I think you can use to actually separate those out. So if you're interested in plotting those points individually, I think that's what it's getting at. If I'm, understanding so, this correctly 
So the interaction thing that they mentioned, the problem with that interaction is that I wish that they would have um, they would have provided an example where that interaction is true because in the book, let me pull that part here. Um, I think you can see the book right now, right? So the the thing that they are alluding to is that if you have, for example, let me see. Yeah, it has to be over here. Anyway, but the thing that they say is that if you wanted to do an interaction between two variables in the group, oh, here it is. If a group isn't defined by a single variable, but instead by a combination of multiple variables, use interaction to combine them. So that's great. But the problem is that the they provide this as an example, but those variables don't exist. So we cannot see how that graph looks like. And I thought about, uh, but I didn't have time, but I thought about um, like making the the data, what do you call this thing? Like um, making like fictitious data where I assign school ID and student ID so that we could actually see this interaction. Um, but, you know, I didn't have a lot of time for this, but the idea is that this is going to combine. So when school ID is one, for example, and student ID is one, that's going to become your group. And that's going to be one of the lines that you have. And then the other line that you have is going to have for school ID two and student ID two, for example. And then, you know, one, two. And it's going to create this interaction between these two variables so that each group is all the school IDs with all the student IDs, right? So. But the but that those variables don't exist. That's the problem. It's, so it was it was so it was so silly. This chapter to me made absolutely no sense. I don't even know what they're trying to. Other than the the topics that I tried to tell you, I don't know what the what the idea was. Because then when they start talking also about this individual uh, and collective genes. So this is, for example, again, um, using the group subject, and then you're going to have, for each one of your groups, a smooth line. Perfect. And then if not, then you're just using one. Perfect. That's the best example that I have here. The rest, I don't even know what they're trying to do. So this is like the difference between like sort of like collective and individual, maybe, because this is a collective one, right? Like you have a mean linear model for all of your individuals versus here for each one of your subjects, you have a line. Well, no, but that's still a collective geome though, <clears throat> because for each, it is. because it's still being created from more multiple rows of the data set. Um, so I think they're just is, trying to show you, you that there's control over the collective geomes is pretty complicated. It is, but you, you, I guess that they are trying also to say if the if their if their idea was to show difference between individual, which is gonna be each one of my points here, right, are not connected to anything else. It's just a point for each observation. I guess sort of like that's what they're trying to do here. Like each one of my groups have a linear model. I understand that that's a collective one. So I think maybe that's why they put the example that there too. But I don't know. So again, this is very confusing for me. So I, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. This one yeah. needs to be rewritten. <laughs> Ashley, I think you well, have something I, to say. Oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Ashley. Um, just sort of related to the um the question about the interactions. I, one thing I was going to ask is um, so when they're doing the fitting fitting the linear model for all of the oxford boys data mm -hmm. i mean technically that's not how you're supposed to do it you should be doing a mixed effects model there rather than just like a plain linear model um do you guys does anybody know if you can do that just in ggplot like would you use like would using interaction effectively do so that? i think that so first first part of you 
your question, this should have been a, a GLM or something like that. I think that's what you said, a mixed models, a mixed model. Yeah. So I think it depends if you care, if you care about seeing differences across your groups, then yes. If you, you just want to say, let's just put everyone together and see what happens with the overall trend, then that's why they're, this is again a silly example, right? Like that, that's why they went with LM. In my understanding, you have to use um, other packages to do mixed models. Yeah. Um, for GM Smooth, let's take a look at the one that it accepts. Um, GM Smooth. Yeah, maybe you might be able to do it there. I don't know. So the because I that it accepts. Yeah. I've had to do this before, where I've had to, you know, like plot. Uh plot essentially the mean for all individuals but you have to take into consideration the fact that like you might have different sample sizes for each individual so the ones with a larger sample yeah. size are gonna like have an outsized effect on the mean if you just do it as like a linear model or in my case it was they were curves but if you just do it as a regular model without taking into account like grouping so yeah so so yeah that's that's models i think that's different but if we're gonna talk about the graph graphing a model that you already like sort of did i think that um ggplot has um plays very well let's say with other packages like ngcv or um there's another one too that i don't remember the name of it but some of the other packages do play well so that you can actually put either the method or do all the your ggplot and then plus the use like the method or something that the other package is using. So these are yeah. the ones that for the time being they accept. So they do an LM. So when you do method here, the in the GMS most method, you can put LM or you can specify GLM or you can say GAM or this loss one or LOS one. I never know how to say that one. Uh, so, so this lowest one, um, I don't remember really exactly, but it's going to do a linear model when you have less than a, a thousand observations. And that's like the warning that is going to show you here is going to be, if you didn't set anything here, it's going to revert to that one, I think. Um, so yeah, so, so there are other, um, other packages that work better for visualizing uh, more complex models, I think, but that play well with ggplot. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. But if anybody else has any other um, comments about that, please, now's the time. Um, yeah, I'm trying to... Yeah, it was mostly just that I've had to do this before, and then I, I think I, like, you know, I ended up just, like, making my own confidence mm -hmm. inter intervals instead of like letting ggplot do it and i think i probably could have used smooth with the formula argument but i don't know that's a problem yeah i have i that's a good question when to use the gm smooth i think maybe we can devote some time to talk about that maybe not right now but maybe it's part of another chapter or something. Because I think I yeah. agree with you. Let's explore the GMs smooth a little bit more. Um, in my models, like uh, Bayesian models that I have done, I do like my data frame, my table, it already has like my critical interval. And if I'm doing um, a mixed model, like you said, I also create like my, um, my data frame with all my data that then I put in ggplot. But I don't use the GM smooth so that ggplot do the model for me. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think it can be done. I do it using other packages, right, Dif separately. And then I just use ggplot to visualize what I already estimated. But I think you're right that we should explore GM smooth a little bit more. So yeah. let me put a let's put a pin on that one so that if we, if if there's no chapter on GM smooth. Maybe we can talk about it in one of the other chapters. Because I don't know. 
I also wonder if it would be helpful since this book, like they're currently updating the edition and that's why some of the chapters are weird. I wonder if it would be helpful if we just like made note of the the things that we find confusing or strange and like we can send it to them and just be like, hey, we did this as a book club. These are the things that we found sort of challenging. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. How do you want to do that? Do you want us to put some comments in in Slack or do you want us to work on like a, a drive, like a document in Drive where we put for each one of our chapters some bullet points with observations? Uh, yeah. We can, um, go ahead. Colin? Go ahead. Uh, well, we yeah. could. Uh, I mean, they have. I mean, they have the repo for it, so you can just file an issue on GitHub. You know, so if you find like an issue that's confusing, you can file an issue, um, and then hopefully they'll address it. I mean, I don't know how active the repo is, but if they're actively working on it, those issues will. I know that's what Hadley will probably go for. I don't know Hadley personally, but um, seeing how he he does some of his work, he relies heavily on issues, and so. Um, yeah, just find yeah, an so issue, I think, and I'll address it. When we, yeah, so to send it to them, I think that's a great idea. We can file a, an issue in GitHub, but to collect the information of the issue, mm. I guess that's sort of like what I'm trying to ask. How do you want to yeah. collect that information for, for the issue? We can, I think that the easiest way would be to open up a, a Google document and then we go bullet points are you, are you losing yeah i don't know what you yeah, think yeah that works that works or yeah that works or um yeah but that works too i mean just as long as you have like a, a centralized location of like these are the questions that we have um regarding this i think that would work for me all right yeah, yeah i like that idea actually but yeah we can do that I will let John know so that he, you know, he's aware of that we're doing this because obviously he's our beloved leader and we follow his lead. <laughs> this is his. Yeah, this is his. He might have some luck. suggestions on the best way to go about it too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I will write that down in the Slack thingy um, so that it's public for the book club. So that, and I will tag him and say. John, we discussed this today. What do you think? So that he's aware. However, that and you all can see what I put there so that you can comment to and then add for, for more things to the message. Because if they're actively, like you said, if they are rewriting it, then maybe we're still, you know, yeah. we could still um, make valuable contributions, right? I mean, the last the last update on the branch or the last update for their main branch to the book was last year. Um, but I don't know if there's other branches. Yeah, I don't see any other branches right now. So they might be working on something else, but they'll come back to it. Um, but yeah, as of last year, there hasn't been any pushes or any commits to the main branch of the book. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Maybe John knows too, because he he knows everything. So he might know if they're actively working on it or if they just abandon the project. Yeah, he might know. I don't think they abandoned it. I think they I think I think what they do is is like they focus like they'll like dig really, really deep into something, like spend a lot of time on it, like fixing the repo or fixing the books and stuff, and then they'll push out an addition and then that's how they kind of work in like um blocks of areas and then i don't know what they're working on currently but um okay. that's kind of how they work it's yeah. like they'll dig into like one thing really really like really focus on it get it all cleaned up and then pull in everything and then they'll move on to another project um which is yeah interesting to that's see that's true you guys i have to go because my boss is here and i have a meeting but um we will reconvene next week okay thank you all for being here see you next week yeah see you